Hey, so I am not going to be talking about EWX tonight, but I am going to talk about something that has completely changed my career over the past couple of years and that hopefully can help you as well. So I'm going to be talking about blogging. So I am a software engineer. I have been for almost six years and I am right now a software engineer and developer advocate for Dev2, which is a community for developers. I'll talk about it a little bit tonight, but also just my experiences with blogging. I am an ace battle on the internet, so if you're tagging me, I will see that. So tonight we're going to talk about first my story, why I'm talking about this, why it's important to me. Then we're going to talk about why you should also blog, and then we'll also talk about some common blockers that people find when they're starting to write, and the maybe roadblocks that you may come across when you start blogging. We'll also discuss how to start building a readership, because I know that that's important for a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And at the end, I'll answer Q&A so that you can have your specific questions answered if you're a little bit more advanced or anything like that. It's a great time for that. So, how I started. A year and a half ago, I wanted to start challenging myself to learn more things. So I started this blog on learning new things. My goal was to learn a new technology every week, build an application with it, and then write a blog post on it, which is a lot of work, but it allowed me to learn all these really cool things. I learned how to do augmented reality in JavaScript. I learned how to wrote, write Golang. I learned how to build art with CSS. All these things that I wouldn't do normally in my day job, I was challenging myself to learn to write about it. And so, I wrote in my first ever blog post, this project is mainly for myself. I want to tailor my learning and get exposure to new technologies. I hope it'll be a learning opportunity. So turns out it became way too much. As you can imagine, that was a huge challenge for myself to be writing all those blog posts, learning all those things, building those applications. But it was still really great for me. So, my first blog post got 36 readers, and I wrote a fashion blog in high school, and that got no readers whatsoever. So I thought that 36 was like pretty good and doing really well. So blogs start small, I'll say that. But when I was writing these things, some of them gained a little bit of traction within their communities because I wasn't writing tutorials, I was writing about how easy or hard it was to learn this thing. So. One of my more critical posts was on Elm, which is a functional programming language for the front end. And it was essentially writing about how hard it was to learn in comparison with a lot of things because a lot of the documentation was broken at that point. And every time you Googled, you got for a different version than they were currently on. And that was my first blog post that got any attention. And I got a couple thousand readers from it, which was unreal to me at the time. And then people were asking me to come speak about the blog post that I was writing. So not that many people were reading stuff, but I was still getting asked to speak about these things, about augmented reality and JavaScript, which I'm now traveling across the world to talk about this year. And so even though my blog was relatively small, it was still helping my career. And I abandoned this one, but it was still helpful. So last summer, I'm a little bit of an impulsive person when it comes to moving places, hence why I'm in New Hampshire for the summer, um, where I actually grew up and this is my first talk in New Hampshire, so pretty excited about that. So last summer I moved to Connecticut. I didn't know a single person there, and so I had a lot of free time on my hands. And I started a second <coughs> blog. This one was called The Zen of Programming, and the whole entire idea behind it was to write the blog post that would have helped me when I was starting to code. I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb in computer science classrooms and in tech events and even at work. I was the only woman and I didn't really know many other women in the field. And so I was writing this blog as a letter to my former self. All the stuff that would have helped me when I was starting out and themed towards people like me too. So all the terminology was really broken down. The styling was more according to what I liked. And I wanted to write towards myself as my target audience. So that ended up taking off really fast. So it was really helpful for me, and it was nice to write all these blog posts that 
would have been awesome for the former version of myself. And as of now, 1.1 to 1.2 million people have read my blog posts in the past year. So next week will be my one year anniversary of this blog. And it's been completely transformational for my career. Uh, I even got a job from it. So I now work for Dev2 and I help other people write blog posts by writing the, the software for that. So here are some reasons that I think blogging is really important. First, you're going to reinforce your own knowledge on something. In order to teach something, you have to know it really well. And to explain all the nuances of it, you have to know it from a lot of different perspectives, especially if you can teach it in multiple ways to appeal to multiple learners. So you're reinforcing your own knowledge. You're also demonstrating that knowledge to other people. So other people are seeing that you really know some topic that you're writing about. If you can explain React, that means that you probably know it well enough that you could use it on the job and build some really cool things with it. So it's huge from a career perspective as well. You can also build a community, which has been really awesome for me, and meet other people who have similar interests to you, who like the same technologies as you, who are coming from a same, similar position. And it's awesome to make those friends, and a lot of those people are some of my favorite people now, the people that I've met through this. It's also great for challenging yourself and keeping yourself accountable. So I had this challenge for myself of building an application every week and writing a blog post on it, which I wasn't perfect at by any means, but I was doing so much more than if I hadn't challenged myself. So even though I wasn't hitting it one application a week, I wasn't perfect about it, I was still doing so much more than if I hadn't had that challenge for myself in the first place. So I was keeping me accountable and making sure that I was still developing my skills even if my during my day job, I was doing the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis. I was still expanding my skill set. And then my favorite part of it is that you're helping other people as well, especially once it grows a little bit. There are other people out there trying to learn what you're learning, and it's so rewarding to see it click for them, or for them to thank you for your blog post, or for somebody to reach out to you and say that this really helped me to learn this. So that is the best part for me, but. All of these reasons are why I blog and why I recommend other people blog as well. So the first thing I want to talk about mechanically about writing a blog is coming up with topics because that's how you're going to get people to read the blog post in the first place. So first of all, I would say to not worry too much about having a totally unique topic. Most blog topics have been written already by somebody at this point. The internet's pretty big and there are a lot of people writing things out there. So I like to give the example of my React tutorial. I wrote a React tutorial last summer. React is a super well used front end framework and there are tutorials galore out there. There are probably hundreds of thousands of React tutorials. So I wrote this way after the first wave of them. And it's still my most read blog post. Almost 100,000 people have read my React tutorial. Because I came at it from a different angle than a lot of people and explained it in a way that made sense to me. And so even if somebody else has written on a similar topic, you still add something to the conversation. You still have a unique way of explaining it. And you can add something new that may help people in a different way. You've also probably used it differently at work and can look at something from a different perspective. And so your voice is still very much needed. Obviously, don't go plagiarizing somebody else's work. That's not a good look. But don't worry about writing this revolutionary blog post that nobody else has written about before. My favorite thing to write about in blog posts is to find the thing that would have helped you in the past. So if you're Googling something over and over again, and you're not finding a great answer, and every Stack Overflow answer that you find is kind of broken, this is the perfect opportunity to write that down and then write a blog post about it in the future because it's something that you really were challenged on and having a better resource on that is pretty much needed. So would definitely recommend that. Or if you just had trouble learning something, if the resources that are out there didn't fit your style of learning and didn't click for you immediately, write something that would have helped you. Another option is to reach out to your network. So 
reach out to your followers on Twitter and say, what blog posts do you, are you looking for? Or you can also go to forum sites, sites like Reddit or Quora, and see what people are asking. So are people asking, what's the difference between state and props, or what's this thing in AWS? If people are asking those questions, then that's a pretty good opportunity to write a blog post about that, if you're seeing the same questions over and over again. So I would also say that your blog posts don't always have to be incredibly technical. They don't always have to be tutorials or anything like that. They can also be just your story. And that's a really great way to connect with your audience and share the real part of yourself. So you can just tell your story of learning how to code or your story of working on some project at work or some time that you felt imposter syndrome or any of those things will still really help somebody even if it doesn't have a ton of code in it or anything like that. My biggest tip though is once you have a topic that comes to mind, write it down because I guarantee you when you sit down to write a blog post, you're probably going to be like, I don't know what to write about. And so if you have a list of things that you do want to write about in the future, then you can go to that list and find something and write about it then. So I have a Trello board with all my topics that I want to write about in the future, and so I have them all there. I also, for more advanced writers, people who are looking to be really consistent about it, I would recommend doing a content calendar. So having like an actual calendar up and put on that calendar what you're going to write about at different times, so that then you can kind of distribute your writing and be like, oh, I'm writing about this this week, maybe I should write about something slightly different this week, and then this a different week. So that could be something once you're writing in a more consistent schedule. So tips for titles when you're writing these posts. The first one is to be descriptive, so say what you're actually um, talking about, and make them catchy, so something that people want to read, but don't be clickbaity either, that's just annoying. I like to do a lot of like complete beginner's guide to React or complete beginner's guide to programming. That's kind of my favorite formula, but there are lots out there that can work. People like numbers in titles too, so if you can say like five tips or five things you didn't know about this, they tend to like that. So random tip there. So transitioning over to the content. So now you have a topic, you know what you're going to write about. And the second part of that is actually writing the blog post. So my process, which is going to look different for everybody, looks something like this. I write an outline. What that looks like is not like the ones that you probably wrote in high school, but I write out my headers in a markdown file, and then underneath those headers, I just write a rough version about what I want to write about in the future. So there's not a great flow to it. It's not perfect by any means. I'm just getting thoughts out on a piece of paper, and that really helps me avoid writer's block. So instead of sitting there not knowing what to write, I just write something, even if it's not great at that time. So that kind of brings me to my rough draft, and then from there I revise it a bunch of times. So I first will do a manual revision of it, of just checking for typos on my own, reordering headers to make them make more sense, cleaning up sentences to make them better. And then I use two different editor tools. The first one is the Hemingway editor, and that makes it so that your writing style is more simplistic, so that people can understand your writing more easily. It's really picky, so I don't do it perfectly by any means. It's um, very tough to be perfect at it. And then my second one is Grammarly, which picks up grammar errors. I don't have a proofreader or anybody looking at my blog post before they go live. I just use those automated tools and myself. And then from there, I really like adding visuals to my blog post. So making sure that instead of it just being a wall of text, that there's pictures in there, that there's infographics if it's important. Um, and all of those things as well. So I'll go into a design software and build those, but you can totally do that in different ways as well. Some advice for that content. First, make sure it's accurate. I'll go into after if it's not accurate, because that happens sometimes too, but when you're putting these things out there, you want them to be honest so that people aren't being misled. 
you also probably for your own sake want it to be accurate too because the people on the internet can be um, wild about those things. And then you also make sure, want to make sure that it fits your target audience. So I always have a single person in mind that I'm writing my blog posts to. You could think of like a group of people, but I think having one person in your mind that's your perfect reader, that's the person that you're writing to, usually makes it so that your writing is the most relatable. So making sure that it's something that would relate to that person. So what I mean by this is if your target person is somebody who learned to code a couple weeks ago, is brand new to this, then you're not going to be using jargon in your blog post. You're going to be breaking everything down. You're going to be using simple terms. You're going to be repeating things probably so that they are seeing the same piece of content over and over again. But on the other hand, if your audience is more technical, if it's a senior engineer somewhere, you're probably going to use a little bit more jargon. They probably know what a loop is or they probably know what AWS is. They know what these terms are. You don't have to explain them over and over again. So making sure that you're writing with your audience in mind is something that I think is important. Then another thing is to not use walls of text. So I think a lot of people think of like school essays and want to write those for blog posts. But especially with now the way that people's attention works, it's not going to hold their attention. It's not going to catch them in. What you really want to do is have it so that your content is broken up into sections. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Using subheaders in your content so that people can skip from sketch section to skip section. I also like doing lists within my posts, so bullet points for certain sections. Infographics, which I talked about before, so that people can look at that. Um, and paragraphs that are somewhat short so people can read those simply as well. So essentially you want your content to be really, really skimmable. And if somebody sees that content, just glancing at it, they have a good idea of what's in it. And they get interested in it and don't think it's just an essay that they're going to get really bored while they're reading it. So another thing is to identify keywords for search engine optimization. This is a little bit more of an advanced one that you may not do at first, but if you're trying to build a bigger audience, you may want to target some keywords for um, that. And I can talk more about that in a little bit. And then the optimal post length is roughly 1500 words to A, catch people's attention and keep it, but B, also be good for the search engines. That's not a hard and fast rule. You can write awesome blog posts that are super short and super targeted. That's totally valid. You can also write super long skyscraper posts that are really comprehensive about things. That's fine too. But generally the rule of thumb is like 1500 words is the golden standard. And I talked about this before, but Grammarly and the Hemingway editor are two tools that make my editing process totally automated. People tend to ask me a lot about like having a person edit their stuff, and you can hire people on Fiverr to do it if that's something that you're really interested in. There are technical writers on there that can proofread for you too, but these tools have served me really well. I haven't found it necessary to have a person doing it. So the third part in this process, once you have a topic, once you have your content written, is actually going ahead and publishing that post. So first off, where are you going to publish this post? So the one that I use the most now is Dev2, which is a specific platform for developers. So everybody on there is going to be looking for developer content. And the nice part of it is that it is big enough that a lot of people see your content, but small enough in relation to something like Medium where your content can still be featured on the front page, even if you're a new writer and more people will have their eyes on it. So Dev2 really allowed me to build my platform and that's kind of where I started. I started actually first off on Medium and then started gaining an audience once I did Dev2. So Medium's another one that you have probably heard of, so that one could be valid as well. And then the third option is to build your own site. So my advice here is to write a couple blog posts first before writing your own website. 
The reason for that is, is that you'll know that you like writing after those couple posts, or you don't. It's totally valid if you don't enjoy blogging, by the way. You can still have an awesome career in tech without it. And so, I would say to write for a little bit, post it on some other site before you put all that time and effort into writing your own blog site or paying for hosting or any of those things. Make sure that you're interested in it and something that you're gonna stick to before you sink all that time into it. Um, that's what I did and totally uh, recommend that to other people as well. Oh, and the other nice thing about that is that you don't have to publish to just one. So even if you're posting to your own site, you can still cross post to Dev2 or Medium. So you can use something called a canonical URL and I can talk about that more at the end so that your search engine juice still goes to your website but people can still see it on those sites as well and it'll actually help your SEO on your own site too. So it doesn't hurt you to still go ahead and cross post even if you do, do build your own site. And that was my big strategy for starting to build this was to cross post everywhere and get as many eyes as possible at least while I was starting out. So in the publishing process, I think there are a lot of self-doubts that people have before they actually send this blog post out into the world. And I'll go ahead and talk about some of those. So the first one is, I'm not experienced enough to write about this. I wrote my whole entire blog about being new to different topics. And the posts weren't perfect. My tech in them wasn't perfect at all. I wasn't necessarily following the perfect best practices about Go. I was writing about my experiences learning it. I was just saying that these are the resources that I thought were helpful. This is what I did and it helped me. So you don't have to worry too much about not being experienced about something. I even think that people who are intermediate at topics are sometimes the best teachers because they're not super, super removed from that learning process. They're not years uh, uh, removed from it where these things are second nature to them. The learning process was relatively recent and they remember the stumbling points that they went through and all the difficult parts about learning it. So even if it's something that is relatively new to you, you still have a unique perspective on it and can really add something to the conversation. So another one is what if my code is wrong or I got a detail wrong? It happens. So I have definitely published stuff with bugs in it or I've copied and pasted something wrong or messed up an indentation or something along those lines. Like It happens. I wouldn't say that it's something that I'm proud of or would aim for by any means and something that I would try to catch, but for every person that's putting a bunch of content out there, it's bound to happen. And for the most part, people are pretty good about being nice about it. Sometimes people will be a little bit rude, but the thing is you still kind of learn something from that, especially if you get some technical detail wrong. You probably misunderstood that or were just making a mistake. And so you learn something from that person telling you, oh, actually, this is the case. So you're learning the correct way. And you can always update these posts, too. They're not like locked on there. You can go and up, press the edit button, update your post, tell the person thank you for correcting me, and then move on. So it's not the end of the world if you get a detail wrong. It happens to every content creator I know. So another one. What if people are mean on the internet? <laughs> this is something that I deal with on an infinite number of times a day kind of basis at this point in my life. So I won't say it gets easier. I won't say that it's something that is easy to deal with by any means. And I will also say that it actually happens less frequently than I thought would happen. Um, so when I was starting out, it maybe would be one-off rude comments very, very infrequently. And when it's infrequent, it's easy enough to, to overcome. Um, and then my stuff started really getting traction and would get kind of featured on places on the internet that are less friendly and then you get the onslaught of them. That's a little bit harder to deal with. So my advice for this is that I normally will write out responses to these people. I'll screenshot them, delete it. So it gets that kind of like 
rage out there, it makes it so that you're responding, you feel that there's some sort of closure with it, but then you're not going through the drama of sending it out there, dealing with their responses or anything like that. Another thing that I'll do is I'll send it to friends. So I'll be like, this is my response to this, and they'll laugh about it and be like, go Allie, that's awesome, and then we can forget about it. So that's my biggest strategy with it. Also just making friends with people in similar positions to me who are content creators and deal with it as well. Um, and then I will say that sometimes I will say something publicly. So if something really bothers me, maybe I will respond to that person. And it's usually not for that person themselves. So it's not to educate that one troll because that troll is probably not going to respond well to being called out about it. It's for the people looking on to it. So it's the, the audience that's reading my response. They may learn from it. They may know that this isn't the way to treat people. This isn't the way to interact with people. And so maybe it'll help them in the future too. So people are mean on the internet. It happens. Knowing that it happens to other people, I think helps to some extent. Making a community of other people who are content creators and deal with it as well is important. And then also, just knowing that you can vent about it, write out your responses, but then usually calling it out publicly can cause more strength than it's worth. So I will say though that there's so much more positive and so many more positive people than there are negative people or rude people. Um, the vast majority of people are so kind and thank you and say nice things about your blog post and that makes it so, so, so worth it and way outweighs the, um, people saying negative things. So I'd say it's still 100% worth it even though there's a hard part to it as well. Okay, and so brings me to my next section of how to actually gain a readership because that's one of the hardest things when you're starting out. I'll preface this by saying that it is perfectly valid to have other goals with your blog. So you can totally write for yourself, for your friends, for your company, for a small targeted audience, you don't have to want to grow your blog. You don't have to want to make it have a ton of readers. That does not have to be your goal. Everybody has a different goal and that's perfectly valid as well. So I will say though that most people usually do want to gain a readership and so this is my advice for them. So the first one is consistency. When I was growing, I would publish my posts first thing every Monday morning. So people knew to look at my blog every Monday morning and see what I had written. That kind of built it up as a habit for them to want to read your content, know when it's coming, know what it's gonna generally be about. And so that's something that was really helpful for me. That being said, writing once a month is still consistent. Writing once a quarter is still consistent. So you don't have to be writing every week, you don't have to be writing every day, just write on some sort of schedule that works for you. I will also step back and say that even if you write one blog post, that can still be really, really helpful for people. So just writing that one thing and publishing it is still totally valid. You don't have to become a huge consistent blogger overnight if you don't want to still publish it. It's worth it. But if you're looking to make it more of a thing, consistency does really help. Another thing is to build a newsletter. Your email list as a content creator is the one thing that you actually have control over. So with social media and the search engines, those algorithms can change overnight and your traffic can dramatically drop, but your email list you own and can send emails to no matter what. So that algorithm isn't gonna change, people's inboxes are, are still there. Um, so, Another thing along those same lines is to not rely too heavily on one traffic source. So my example of this is that very recently, last month, Google changed their algorithm for the search engine. Daily Mail's traffic dropped by 50% overnight. That's a lot of money. And so if your whole entire strategy is search engine optimization and overnight the algorithm changes, that's a big problem. So instead of just relying on one thing, try to try different things. So try different social media, try cross posting, try building a newsletter, try SEO, try all these things. 
at least to some extent if you're trying to build something really steady. Another thing is to use analytics tools to see your growth because that can be really helpful for people to know that it's growing and to know that people are reading your stuff. You can also use that to see, oh, people are really, really liking this blog post. This is what they're going to most often. You can also see where they're coming from and all of those things. So definitely use your analytics tools. It's super awesome um, to know that it's growing. We talked about cross-posting before, but that was my big strategy for growing, at least at first, when I didn't have social media, I didn't have SEO experience. I was just cross-posting and my stuff would get featured and that really helped me grow. So definitely try to do that. Another strategy could be to write for other people's blogs. If you have friends or something along those lines, you could write guest posts and then ask them to read your blog afterwards. So that could be one strategy there. Another thing that I always do is I link to my old posts within mm -hmm. my posts. So if you like this blog post, keep reading to see this other one that was really, really similar. Or I'm not gonna go into HTML and CSS in this blog post, but it's here if you wanna read it now. It'll also help boost your SEO, but it'll also keep people reading your content. And one of the biggest things for SEO is time on page. So if people are staying on your page for a long time or on your site, that's gonna be a positive sign to Google that people are liking your content. So uh, definitely link to your own posts within your posts. Social media is a huge one. I think for developers, Twitter is really the by and far largest one and the one that I would recommend there. Uh, Reddit would be the other one. But Reddit's a little bit trickier to promote blogs on because they're against self-promotion to some extent. So Twitter is probably the most reliable to try to grow that if you're um, looking in tech. And then SEO, search engine optimization, there's a ton of strategy that goes into that and it's important to do that to be featured on those search engines. And most big blogs are really reliant on SEO. And then the final one is to have an RSS feed so that people can subscribe to your writing. I think the users of that is a little bit smaller than it used to be, but still a good thing to have. Cool, so that brings me to the end of my advice slides. So now I want to turn it over to you all and answer any questions that you have about writing a blog, content creation in general, any of that, those things. So I'm curious, do you still recommend using Medium? I, I, I've seen there's a lot of con controversy around their policies. So I can talk from my perspective. So Medium helped me grow to some extent. I was writing for Free Code Camp and Hacker Noon, which were the two biggest publications on Medium at the time. And so that was really helpful. Both of them have since moved off of Medium. And those were the two biggest tech publications on there. So I think it'd be really hard to grow on there now, in my opinion. Um, and I think that tech in general is kind of moving away from the platform and they're focusing more on like essay writing and stuff like that. So it's not my top choice, but it may still be worth trying if you're starting out. Can you talk more? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask for SEO. Do you put the keyword, try to get the keywords in the content itself, or is that something you do more on the publishing site? Totally. So you would do it in the content itself, but you would make it flow naturally. So instead of trying to what's called like keyword stuff of just writing these like long sentences that are strings of keywords, you would put them naturally in your content. And they're weighted more if they're in your headers than if they're in just your body content. So try to put them in your headers if that's something that you're looking for. Also putting them in like your description of your post as well is, is good. Um, and putting them in the first paragraph is also, also good. So that's kind of keyword strategy. There are a lot of tools out there for starting out. So my first one, the, my favorite one is free. It's called Keywords Everywhere. It's a browser extension for Chrome. And anything that you search, it will tell you how many people are searching that thing. I would recommend starting to try to target keywords that are in the 100 to 1,000 searches per month, which isn't huge. But when you're starting out, your blog also won't be huge most likely unless you have an audience built up somewhere else. And so targeting those smaller keywords will also make it so that more people are reading that post, more people are spending time on your site, and it'll mean that you can start ranking for those bigger keywords as well. 
So start with the smaller 100 to 1,000 search a month keywords. It'll be easier to get on the front page of Google with those. And then you can build into bigger keywords from there. What's that browser extension called? Yeah, Keywords Everywhere. Thank you. It also works for YouTube if anybody has a YouTube channel. Yeah, and then uh, I did want to ask, uh, what was the cross-post tool that you mentioned, Canonical? Yeah, Canonical URL. So essentially a Canonical URL is a property or a meta tag that you will set that says that this is the original piece of content. So if there's multiple versions of your content online, Google looks at that and is like, oh, this is all plagiarized. It doesn't know which one's the original version. So it doesn't like duplicate content, it doesn't like plagiarism, so it'll devalue all of those. So if you're cross-posting, what you want to do is set that canonical URL to say, this is the original version, point all the search engine juice to this, and this version is a cross-post. So if you're using Dev2, you can set the canonical URL on there. There's an editor that allows you to do that if you're using the newer version of the editor, if you're using the older version, you can do it in what's called the front matter, if it's in Markdown. Um, on Medium, you have to do the uploader tool, and that will add your uh, canonical URL there. Yeah? Um, besides Grammarly, you had one other tool mentioned. Yeah, the Hemingway editor. Hemingway, okay. And then, so, if do you ever write like very specific technology specific, possibly in version specific blogs? <coughs> Yeah, totally. So, so yeah. So, so my, my question then is, uh, say a year or two down the road, do, do you maintain these old blogs and update them to latest versions? Like uh, from own experience, you're looking at a two-year-old Java something XYZ book, and none of the examples run anymore because next version, they all broke. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So I think it depends on your goals and how you're keeping up with things, but I would totally recommend going back to those old posts and adding new knowledge and making it so that they're compatible or adding notes, there's new, now a new version, and use this for this version, this for this version. I think that that's super helpful, especially if things start breaking and less, being less relevant, then people are, less people are going to read it. Can, can you kind of republish that? after update or so? Yeah, totally. And a lot of places will re-feature, or if you have your own blog, you can re-feature that content so it goes to the top. Um, I read a piece of advice recently to have a core set of blog posts, like your favorite ones, and maybe write one of those a month, and so you have like these 12 awesome posts that you're completely in love with, and then every year, when at the time that you wrote it, Originally, you go ahead and update that post, so you're doing it yearly, and you're doing it according to this calendar, so that every year you're hitting back to that one post. I don't know if that's like the, the advice that I have followed by any means, but I think it's a cool idea and something that would be worth trying if that's kind of up your alley. Are there any SEO experts that you follow to get um, certain tips? So I. Personally, I use a tool called Mangles, which is a paid service that allows you to pinpoint them. Um, the kind of industry standard one is called Ahrefs, but it's like a couple hundred dollars a month, and so it's really, really expensive. But if you're looking to be like the blog, that's probably the one to go with. So that's where most of my stuff comes in. I'm also part of a Slack group that if anybody wants an invite, you can like DM me somewhere and I can get it to you. Um, but we talk about these things all the time and they've been really helpful for me. So that's mostly where I've learned all this. But um, yeah, those are the ones that I know about the most. How do you spell A, H, refs? Yeah, so A and then space H, E, or H, R, E, F, like an A, H, ref tag. In HTML. Thank you. Doesn't yeah. sound very SEO friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. True. And what, 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 was, what was the first one you had mentioned? Uh, Mangles. So M A N G O O L S. This feels like a second grade spelling test. I like it. Yeah, I can also pull these things up too. So. So this is a e and then 
uh, maples. And then that's keywords everywhere. That's the free one, where it's telling me that uh, keyword research tools has a search volume of 12,100 a month. And the competition is pretty strong for that, whereas the competition for KW Finder is lower. So um, that's the keywords everywhere exception. It's super helpful. And when you're starting out, you want to target things that are lower competition. And then as you move on, you can target higher and higher competition stuff. Is there a platform you like for hosting your blog content, or do you write your own? So when I have written my own blogging sites, I've used Gatsby.js, which is a really, really cool framework that allows you to uh, build progressive web apps pretty quickly using React.js. And there's a ton of plugins for it. So that's kind of my favorite if you know web development. So that's called Gatsby. I would search Gatsby.js, because as we're talking about SEO, Gatsby is going to bring you to the great Gatsby. Um, Gatsby JS is kind of my favorite. I've also heard great things about Ghost. A lot of people use WordPress. Um, the issue with anything with a backend is that you're going to probably have to pay for hosting, which probably won't be a problem in an AWS group. But I like these static sites because you can get free hosting on something like Netlify or GitHub Pages. So that's what I tend to gravitate towards just so that it's a free process, especially when you're starting out. Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. One, um, you talked about the perfect length being 1,500 words. Um, does that ever drive you to make a multi-part series? That's not something that I, I think you mentioned. Like, um, this week we're doing this, tune in next week, and I'll build on that. Do you ever do that, or would you go more the one long blog post, get it all done in one? Yeah. So, I have done the series thing. So I have uh, broken down what could be a really, really long blog post into multiple blog posts. I'm not sure if in the future I would do that. Google really likes posts that answer a bunch of questions in one, so the kind of skyscraper resources that have a bunch within them. So that may be what I would gear towards in the past or in the future, but I definitely have done the series thing, and I think it can be really engaging and um, great for having people tune in again and again. So I think that's totally valid, but I also think that writing a really long blog post is too. But it can make it so that it's more achievable, so that you're at least getting something out, and it feels a little bit rewarding that people are reading at least the first part or whatever too. Um, then the other question I had, you're talking about defining your audience. Um, and being aware of who your audience was. Do you ever find that if there's a topic that you could approach from a very technical perspective, but you don't know if there's a very technical audience, that you might rewrite that blog post or write it from the perspective of a, of a developer rookie? Um, because So I guess what I'm asking is, do you shift the content you write based on where you think the larger target audience is? Or if you have something that's wicked technical, are you going to write it wicked technical because that's what you believe is right? Yeah, so I can totally answer this. So I will say that there is always going to be a way bigger beginner audience than advanced audience. It's just the way things are. There are way more people who are new to something than that are experts at anything. And that's just kind of the way things are. And so I normally write towards the beginner audience because that's more in line with my goals, and my goals are to teach as many people as possible. That being said, if your goal is more, I want to look super, super great to employers and establish myself as a total expert and make it so that everybody reading this thinks that I know a ton about this topic and I want to get hired doing this, then writing the super technical blog post that's more advanced is totally, totally valid and can help you with those goals. But if your goal is to reach as many people as possible, Writing it at a more beginner slant is usually a better strategy, just because that audience is bigger. At least making it so that you have a beginner post that leads or funnels into that more advanced one. Like, here's all these terms broken down. Here's an introduction to this topic. Now go read my more advanced post, because um, 
this is great too. Or you can even just link to somebody else's beginner post on to it too. Mm -hmm. say, before you read this, go read this. Um, another funny story about audience. So I said that my audience was the previous version of myself, like youngish woman in tech who are new to this and all of that. That is not my audience whatsoever. So that's my ideal person that I have in mind and who I think about when I'm writing. My audience is like, at least when I started out, was like 90% men, much older than me, and had been engineering for a while for the most part. So I was ready to a very different audience that I was targeting, but that audience was still a big audience and still really liked what I was writing. And so it worked even though I had a different audience visualized in my mind. And so I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. Even if you're targeting one audience and you get a different audience, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that um, you're still just writing with somebody in mind and then that audience can be broader. That can be helpful too. Would you consider breaking out your content into multiple blogs if you had, um, say, one side is programming, one side is <coughs> video editing or something? Yeah, totally. So. I think that you can do it under one roof, it, depending on what your goals are. If you're doing it under like a personal brand and maybe your name, then I think it's totally valid to have it on one site if you think that your audience will be okay seeing both types of content. But maybe if you're doing it under a name and you have like a brand associated with your blog, you would probably want to do two just so that you have your two different audiences in different places. Then it becomes more work because you probably have to have two different sets of social accounts and all that. So it's definitely a lot more work, but I would say if you're doing it under you, it's probably easier to do everything under one roof. You're trying to make it into like a brand and have a name for it and all that, and it would be better to split. But I think both are totally valid depending on your goals. Yeah. Um, I was curious, I, if I'm trying to learn something and I'm really stuck, a lot of time I'll go to YouTube videos and watch people coding, you know, and doing those kind of tutorials. Do you find that YouTube is eating into the blogging audience or is there enough room for everybody, I guess? Yeah, so I think that there's totally room for everybody. So I think that everybody has a very different learning style and so they can use those different resources for themselves. So I don't learn well from a video like whatsoever. So I much prefer blog posts and documentation. Documentation will always be what I go to first and try to use. But there's also great video content out there. What I will say is that if you combine, combine multimedia within one post, so maybe link to somebody else's YouTube video or even record one, a quick one yourself on the same topic, and put that in your blog post that will help a ton of people. And that's why I tend to really try to appeal to multiple learning styles within one post. So I'll try to explain things slightly differently within the post. I'll try to embed images. I'll try to embed code samples when possible. If I'm doing something front-end related, I'll do like code pens. There's also code sandbox and all of that so that you can actually embed the code in there. People can run it, they can play with it, they can see what it does there. So I try to make these things as multimedia and engaging as possible so that everybody can learn from it. But um, yeah, YouTube is another great thing and most of this advice actually applies to if you were going to make a YouTube channel too. Um, so yeah, totally. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what percentage of your users come from recurring visitors versus I came here because I found you on Medium or Dev2 Dev versus I stumbled in here from a Google search? Yeah, so I would say right now roughly half my audience is through Google search, half is through social media, but those two audiences actually kind of help build each other. Um, <clears throat> a, that if somebody searches something, likes it, then they may follow me on social media, but if somebody follows me on social media, reads my blog post, spends a lot of time on it, that's a positive signal to Google that somebody liked my blog post and they'll rank it higher. Um, another thing that's huge for SEO is called backlinks. So that's when another blog links to your blog and if that blog has a lot of authority, then that will really, really boost your blog posts and the rankings. So that's like the best thing that you can do for SEO. And if you have strong social media and people are reading your stuff on social media, that's a great way to get backlinks because they see your posts and link it within theirs. So I think that they definitely complement each other. But again, mine is roughly 50-50. Um, it's harder to know now because I mostly post on dev since I 
work there, and it's an awesome, awesome platform. And so uh, the targeting is a little bit less granular than Google Analytics. And so I know less of that data now, but uh, yeah, roughly 50-50. Yeah, totally. Any other questions? Are there any tones or topics that you try to stay away from when you're writing? That's a good question. So I wouldn't say that there's stuff that I specifically stay away from, but there's definitely topics that I steer towards. So like my whole theme is writing to mostly beginner developers, people who are just starting out, and that's really my target audience. And so I'm not going to write super, something super, super advanced or something super, super niche trying to write more like general stuff that will appeal to a broader audience. Um, so it's not necessarily that I'm like avoiding anything, it's just that I have what I write about pretty tuned in. And I think that having a niche that's pretty well defined, at least at first, is really important. You can totally niche out afterwards and expand that niche or add multiple niches, but at least at first if people know to come to you for this, like if you're the accessibility blogger or you're the React person, or you're the AWS person. Like They know that going to your blog, they're going to learn about X thing, and that you're an expert on that. And then once you're already established, and people are reading your stuff, then you can expand that a little bit. But at least at first, I think it's really great to niche down. Um, I think that's one of those like entrepreneur strategies that like the money's in the niches, or whatever. Did you write something interesting about AWS? Me? Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm not, not an AWS person at this point in my life. I've definitely used it a decent amount. In my I'm career, going to. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mostly write about web development. So that's kind of what where my heart is. And I, so I actually used to teach at a boot camp. And so a lot of my writing is somewhat inspired by teaching there and seeing what people struggled with. Both I, I write both technical stuff and then more like the personal side of code, like what's difficult about it personally, what are the barriers that you'll overcome on that side, and so that's kind of what my audience is and what I write about, so I don't do much AWS stuff. I was in process of writing about Lambda functions for my uh, On Learning New Things blog, but that one's kind of fizzled out. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, no, no, you're good. I love it. I think a lot of developers become developers because they aren't writers or they're not good at grammar and everything. So that's cool that you recommended those automated tools. But have you always been good at writing or? Yeah, so I'm lucky. I actually went to school to become a political journalist. So growing up in New Hampshire, I saw all the candidates and was like, I, my dream job is to go chase them around the country reporting on what they do. and. Actually, that's how I got into programming, at least professionally. I took some classes in college, and at first fell in love with it, and then it got harder, and I was like, oh, this isn't for me at all. And I was working on a political campaign, and pretty much automated my own job. I was doing a lot of like Excel work, and started writing scripts, and then was offered a software engineering job off of that. So um, journalism was my career choice, and it didn't pan out because of this, but. I love it because I get to kind of live that life even though I'm a software engineer now. So for me it is, but I wouldn't say that you have to be this like amazing, amazing writer in school or anything like that because it's a, such a different form of writing instead of um, writing these like really, really long essays that follow this certain format, you have a lot more free form and can do stuff more short form or can do more listicle stuff for short paragraphs and all that. That's totally valid within a blog, but it's harder than academic writing. Yeah. Although there are people who write like somewhat successful programming blogs that write in a more academic way on academic topics. So that's totally valid too if you like that, but not how I write usually. I try to write pretty casual and kind of in a way like I'm talking to a friend or something like that. It feels engaging to me. Is there anything you do that you wish other bloggers did more of? I think mostly adding like multimedia into their posts because that makes it so much more engaging and understand, easy to understand. And it also makes it so that the code doesn't break or can't break because you have this live demo and you could tell if it was broken, right, because your code wouldn't work. So that's something that I really enjoy. Um, yeah. 
I also always link to other people's resources. Like, if I learned something from somebody else, I'm always going to give them credit. There's no point plagiarizing it. That makes it so that my writing looks better, that I'm sending my sources and I know that this is for a fact because I heard it here, and I'm crediting that other author, making relationships there as well. So that's something that I wish I saw more too, because I see so many posts that I'm like, oh, like you learned this from X person, you're just not giving them credit. Or even I'll read blog posts and I'm like, that looks an awful lot like my blog post. I don't know if you just came up with that on your own, but yeah. So definitely I like starting, sending my sources too. Anything else? Cool, I've got all my socials on here, so. Yeah. Oh no. Go on. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I have more resources. If you go to that first link, there's worksheets. I do this as a workshop as well, and so there are worksheets from that workshop and a bunch of resources on SEO and all of that. Um, these slides are also going to stay online for forever. So alispit.tell slash blog dash talk. Those are my slides for this. Those are online. Um, Dev2 Spittle is where I write now, so you can write, read all my stuff on there. There's a couple posts about blogging too. And then um, send me your post. So if you end up writing because of this workshop, let me know. I want to see it. I'm excited to see all that. So I am Spittle pretty much everywhere. I also have stickers up here, so please take stickers. They're a lot of fun. And we were talking about laptops before, so uh, deck those out. So yeah, thank you all. All right, and then it doesn't look like Steve was able to make it.